Okay, boys and girls, we're going to do school, chapter 27. It's from the perspective of Capricorn Anderson today. And um, we had just heard from Sophie Donnelly, and she was wondering how he was going to survive without going to the Halloween dance. And that made me start thinking about, well, I wonder, he's been at Garland Farm for a little while. How's that going? So I'm giving you that question today. I'm saying, how is Cap feeling about being back at Garland Farm? See if you can't find any evidence of how he's feeling. I gave the picking pole an expert twist. When I felt the weight of the apple in the canvas catcher, I lowered it to deposit yet another Macintosh into the back skit. It was overripe and not as firm as it should be. Everything at Garland was like that, neglected. And, with rain still hobbling around on a cane, most of the extra work was falling on me. On the whole, we'd been lucky. The fruit was a little past its prime, but the potatoes, carrots, and turnips were in good shape. The really great news was that rain was making a full recovery. Just being at Garland seemed to energize her. By the second day home, she was driving again, taking our truck into town to restock our supplies. She didn't even need me to go with her. There's plenty to be done right here, she told me. Besides, I think you've had enough of civilization for a while. I got her point. I had two black eyes, and my nose still hurt when Darryl, where Daryl had punched it. A wounded raccoon, that's how Rain described me. So off she went, leaving me filling the root cellar with bushel baskets of vegetables, pruning the fruit trees, spreading the compost, getting ready for winter. It was Garland, my Garland, everything I longed for all these weeks, and I was happy to be home. But my mind kept wandering back to the halls of Sea Average Middle School, the crash of locker doors, the babble of excited conversations, the ringing of cell phones, the beeping of Game Boys, the traces of far-off rap music escaping the earbuds of a hundred iPods. It was crowded, noisy, obnoxious, and even scary. But it had its own rhythm and urgency in life, and I missed it. <clears throat> so much it was almost like an ache. At night, I spent hours poring over the yearbooks. Each familiar face triggered an avalanche of memories. Tai Chi on the lawn, sing-along in the music room, tie-dyeing, the hundreds upon hundreds of Halloween dance volunteers. I looked around Garland, and in my heart, I knew it was the best place for me, but the quiet... The dull beiges and greens, the familiar farm chores, the complete lack of other people. This used to be my life. It used to be enough. Before. But did I want to go back? How could I? I spent all my time there wishing I was here. Yet that life kept calling me. I wanted to eat food that was scooped onto my tray by crabby ladies in hairnets and greasy aprons. I wanted to watch reruns of Trigonometry in Tears. I wanted to twist the little metal dial to those mysterious numbers that would magically open my locker. I wanted Sophie Donnelly to call me Freakazoid one more time. In just a couple of hours, the Halloween dance would be starting. It was the responsibility of the 8th grade president. Okay. I knew nothing about dances and had planned 0% of this one. But I should be there. I asked, I'd asked Rain just that morning if I could go, and she'd said no. All that's behind you now, Cap. Our life is here. I know that, I told her. But my name is on all the posters. How can I let everybody down? They won't even notice you're not there, she assured me. You know how people are in the outside world, only interested in themselves and their own mindless fun. I tried another argument. But you always said we should finish what we start, see things through to the end. Cap, when you left that school, that was the end. And a good thing, too. You were only there for a couple of months, and see how much you've changed? You talk about television programs, and you waste your time staring at silly yearbooks. Thank goodness I was able to take you away before the contamination got any worse. Contamination? That was the word she kept using like I'd spent her recovery wallowing in a toxic waste dump. Sure, the Donnelly House and C. Average weren't much like the life Rain and I had built at Garland, 
but different didn't automatically mean bad. Yeah, the more I talked about my experiences of the past eight weeks, the more upset she got. Not angry. That would be a sign of spiritual imbalance. Just really, really worried. Maybe she was right. I was contaminated. Would I ever have stood up to her before my time away from Garland? And for sure, I never would have done what I was about to do. I tore a small piece from the duct tape roll and fastened the note to our refrigerator. Dear Rain, I'm sorry, but this is just too important. Don't worry about me. I'll be home soon. Cat. Rain had the pickup, so that left me on foot. There was a gas station a few miles away. My plan was to go there and use the phone to call a taxi. I didn't have any money, but I still had one last check. That would get me anywhere I wanted to go. I hadn't made this walk since the time the truck ran out of gas. I'd forgotten how long the du and dusty it was. The whole way I didn't see a single vehicle. I couldn't help thinking of the crowded streets around Sea Average. Finally, through the red gold of the autumn brush, I could make out the Service King sign. Maybe it was because I was upset about disobeying rain. Whatever the reason, I didn't notice the car until I was in the middle of the road. The driver slammed on the brakes and the tires shrieked their protest against the asphalt. The sedan spun around its rear end, swinging toward me at an incredible speed. Desperately, I flung myself out of its path. The tailgate missed me by inches and I tumbled into the ditch. The driver jumped out. Mister, are you okay? I would have known that voice anywhere. Sophie? I sat up and there she was peering anxiously down at me. You maniac, where do you get off running into the middle of the road like that? She was right to be upset. It had been a very close call, but all I could think of was, you got your license. And they would have taken it back for running over some freakazoid the very first day. What are you doing here? I asked, climbing out of the ditch and brushing myself off. You're almost at Garland, you know. I'm taking a victory lap 60 miles from where I live. I came to find you, you idiot. And don't think I don't already regret it. Me? That bracelet, when it came back engraved, she accused. That wasn't from my dad, was it? You sent it. I could feel my face burning bright red. She leaned over and kissed my cheek. Supernova was a word I'd read in science books, but this was the first time I'd ever experienced the power of one. Now, get in the car, she ordered. We're going to the Halloween dance. What a coincidence. As we made a U-turn and headed away from Garland, I explained my plan for the trip to Sea Average. You're crazy, she scoffed. No taxi driver would take a check. And even if he did, how were you planning to get home? I figured he'd wait until the dance was over and then her sigh cut me off. Maybe you're better off at Camp Purple Haze. I hate to think what would happen to you in the real world. Well, anyway, I told her, thanks for picking me up. I'm a saint, she noted. My father said that once, but it wasn't true until right now. As we approached the outskirts of town, there was traffic and buildings and lights and people on the streets. I drank in the hustle and bustle, greeting it like an old friend, but I couldn't suppress a pang of guilt, wondering if Rain had come home and found my note. Night had fallen by the time we reached the average. Sophie frowned. Why is the building dark? Power failure, I suggested, but the nearby houses had lights on. We turned the corner and pulled around the side of the school, stopping just short of the main driveway. There was no going in. The parking lot was jam-packed. Not with cars, but with people. It would have been every bit as dark as the school if not for hundreds and hundreds of flickering candles. Sophie was bug-eyed. What's going on? I guess it's the Halloween dance. Oh, come on. Even you can't think that. People dance at a dance. That's why they call it a dance. There isn't any, even any music. I had to admit it seemed pretty strange to decorate the gym and then hold the party in the parking lot. We pulled over to the curb and she handed me a rubber mask with a round black nose and large ears. What's this, I asked. She took a deep breath. Costumes, Halloween, you're Mickey, I'm Minnie. Best I could do on short notice.
We put the heads on and waded into the mob. It wasn't loud, but I realized there was music. Somewhere in the crowd, a single boombox was playing the Beatles' Abbey Road album, Rain's favorite. I surveyed the crowd through the eye holes of my mask. Sophie, how come we're the only ones wearing costumes? All at once, she put a death grip on my shoulder. Look around. Ponchos, tie-dyes, peat signs, cat. They are in costume. They're dressed as you. And with that, I will leave you to wonder what is going on. I hope you enjoyed it. And how is Cat feeling about being back at Garland Farm? All right, catch you tomorrow. Bye.